The first item of business is portfolio questions. I could I ask for questions and answers to be as succinct as possible? And first of all, we have culture, tourism and external affairs. Question number one, Jamie Green. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions the Culture Secretary has had with local authorities regarding their capacity to deal with tourist numbers over the summer. Fiona Hislop. Uh, I've had a number of discussions with local authorities regarding tourism, which have included issues around tourist numbers. The Scottish Government recognises the need to encourage sustainable tourism, and we've taken proactive measures to address the impact of increased visitors, such as through the successful development of our £6 million uh, Rural Tourism Development Fund. Jamie Green. Uh, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that uh, helpful response. Uh, this increase in tourism is very welcome to island communities, but also adds additional pressures, including islanders' abilities to access the islands themselves, with uh, 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 pressures on ferries, uh, including passengers and vehicles. But can I ask what the Cabinet Secretary is doing to promote off-season tourism, to perhaps help and relieve and flatten some of those peaks and spikes in summer tourism? Fiona Hislop. Uh, that's a very important uh, part of, of growing tourism, is to make sure that we can help support uh, tourism throughout the year. I think uh, recent experience actually has been that the season has actually been growing. Uh, obviously, in terms of uh, different experiences, having winter uh, activities very important, but also indoor facilities. The uh, growth of uh, distilleries and visitor attractions and distilleries, providing inside uh, experiences for tourism uh, du tourists during the winter period has also been very attractive. So trying to make sure that we can have uh, provision right throughout the year is a vital part of actually spreading tourism, but most importantly for island, um, uh, island economies, uh, making sure we have a, a sustainable source of those willing to work in the tourism industry because they have families and they need to have incomes throughout the year. I took part in a tourism uh, summit on Isla at the invitation of Brendan O'Hara and uh, Michael Russell as the local MP and MSP. And um, the, again, that was one of the issues they had was how to extend the season. Isla, for example, is having a food festival um, in uh, September, October period. Again, I think that's part of trying to extend the season. Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware that road equivalent uh, tariff has reduced car fares by some 57%, leading to record numbers of visitors to Arlen Cumbria, boosting island economies. And additional ferry now sales are drawn to Broderick Route for seven months, greatly increasing capacity relative to when this government came into office. However, reliability is a key issue. Can the Cabinet Secretary comment on how resilience funds will be used to minimise ferry disruptions which are happening now and islanders fear may happen throughout the summer season? Fiona Hislop. Uh, I understand in, in relation to that latter point that uh, funding was provided uh, £4 million as a resilience fund in 2018 to invest in services to ensure future reliability and availability of vessels. I'm not the Transport Minister, I'm not responsible for ferries, but I absolutely understand their importance to island economies and to tourism. Um, I think people probably forget the, what a difference uh, road equivalent tariff made uh, when it was introduced. Uh, in 2014 and across the piece we saw an increase in 60 percent in, re in uh, cars and transport and 40 percent increase in passenger numbers and that's great in creating demand but it also causes pressures so i do take a keen interest as the tour tourism uh, secretary in what is happening with the, the ferries and their operation but i think that resilience fund and that additional investment um, to help invest um, in our, our, our vessels to improve our reliability i hope will prove um, helpful particularly for the season ahead Claire Baker. Um, thank you. While some local authorities may be facing capacity pressures, other areas of Scotland would welcome more tourists and the income that comes from that. Can the Cabinet Secretary outline any work which is planned to better understand the pattern of tourism in Scotland and consider how we can promote other areas and activities which would help support sustainable tourism and spread the opportunities there are across the whole of Scotland? Fiona Hislop. Uh, that's a hugely important point. The, the uh, member will be aware of our campaign for the south of Scotland, uh, particularly, which has seen Visit Scotland investing in a new promotional film, but also helping in terms of the infrastructure. So, for example, I've announced in recently uh, £200,000 for Glen Tress to improve mountain biking in the, in the Borders uh, area to uh, help uh, invest in that attraction. Only this morning, I was in Aberdeen. Uh, I was speaking at the Aberdeenshire, Visit Aberdeenshire uh, conference, um, very important to, in promoting their particular area to make sure people can find it accessible. And I was delighted 
to hear the news that the New York Times has said that the uh, northeast of Scotland is one of the top 25 places uh, to visit this year. So in terms of our promotion uh, from Visit Scotland, we are absolutely making sure that the wider areas are, are being promoted. And a very good example of that, for example, is uh, working with uh, Wild About Our Gael, where our Gael has twinned with Glasgow to ensure that visitors can come into Glasgow, but then can visit, uh, obviously, the rural areas in the west coast of Scotland. These are all initiatives to try and encourage people, if they're in the central belt, to go out and to visit the uh, far, you know, more geographically remote, but uh, absolutely interesting and fascinating places to visit across Scotland. I know there's a, a lot of answers to some of these questions, but if you could try and shorten your answers, please, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, sorry? <laughs> <laughs> Just as well. <laughs> Question number two, John Mason. Uh, thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what support it can give towards the annual running costs of the Scottish Jewish Heritage Centre in Glasgow. Fiona Hislop. Uh, we value our relationships with our Jewish communities and the significant and important contributions they make to Scottish society. The Scottish Jewish Heritage Centre shares in our ambition to promote interfaith dialogue, to strengthen and enhance connections across communities to lower barriers, eliminate fear and increase understanding. And I recognise the importance of learning about the Holocaust, as well as taking action to tackle religious prejudice, including anti-Semitism. I would urge the centre to explore museum accreditation and related support with Museum Gallery Scotland. Additionally, the next wave of the Scottish Government's Promoting Equality and Cohesion Fund will be open for application in 2020. And I would suggest that the centre considers developing an application in the coming year for relevant projects. John Mason. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for what I think is an encouraging reply. So I would just ask if she could uh, agree with me and I think with the Jewish community. It's not just about the Holocaust, but uh, there is an ignorance about Jews, about Judaism, about Jewish history and the Jewish way of life. And there has been a considerable uh, Jewish community in Scotland. And all of these things can lead to anti-Semitism if people don't understand properly. Fiona Hissler. I, I absolutely agree, and I think the more understanding there is, the better uh, the, the tolerance, appreciation, and indeed celebration of the variety of different uh, religions and cultures that we have in Scotland. And I think that's a very important part of promoting the positives and the experiences uh, that other people perhaps don't understand. And I think the point is very well made by John Mason. Question number three, Miles Briggs. Um, to ask the Scottish Government what assessment it has made of the potential impact of a tourist tax on the tourism sector in Edinburgh and Lothian. Fiona Hislop. Uh, we held a national discussion on tourist taxes involving the industry and local authorities to develop a shared understanding of the evidence, challenges and potential impacts of tourist taxes. Uh, we held roundtables across Scotland, including in Edinburgh stakeholders, including UK Hospitality and Edinburgh Council, uh, provided written evidence, and we published this on the 7th of March. Um, as part of the budget deal with the only party who engaged, we will formally consult on principles of a locally determined tourist tax in 2019 and then introduce legislation. It will be for the individual councils to assess local circumstances before deciding whether to use the power. Miles Briggs. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Leaders of hotel, hospitality and tourism groups in Edinburgh have voiced their opposition and concerns to the plans for a tourist tax in the capital. Um, I think it's fair to say that the Cabinet Secretary's support for the proposal has been somewhat lukewarm uh, to date. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, given these concerns, does she actually believe a tourist tax is a good idea for Edinburgh and Scotland's tourism sector? Fiona Hislop. This is an issue for Edinburgh Council working with the Edinburgh community and the Edinburgh businesses to determine. Uh, but I, I stand by what we've agreed as part of our budget negotiations. Had the Conservatives come to the table in any meaningful shape or form, perhaps the budget discussions might have been different. But we have uh, honoured our commitment. We will honour our commitment. There will be an introduction of consultation followed by legislation. But one of the things that our previous national discussions uh, showed us that it was really complex. It's not a simple perspective. And even today, when I was in uh, Aberdeen, uh, the views there was, although some local authorities may want to introduce it, some may not, uh, the uh, read across between different local authorities and what they do would be important. So therefore, a level playing field across Scotland was something that we heard from. And that's, that's going to be all part of the discussions that local authorities are going to have to take. But if people want to present these arguments, I would encourage them to take part in the consultation on the legislation that will follow as part of our bu budget negotiations. Supplementary from Kezia Dugdale. 
Thank you. Despite what Miles Briggs said, there is widespread support for a tourist tax across Edinburgh, uh, not least from the SNP and Labour Council administration. Last week, the Cabinet Secretary was reported as saying that it would not be in place now until 2021. Is she aware that the Council have actually budgeted for it to be in place next year? And in light of the delay that she announced last week, they will now have to make a further £10 million worth of cuts to the local council budget. Can she tell us where she thinks those cuts should come from? Fiona has, the member has been uh, a member of this parliament for some time. She'll know the legislative process and procedure that takes place when introducing new legislation um, in relation to decisions that Edinburgh Council will make. That's a matter for Edinburgh Council. But we will consult, as agreed in 2019, there will be legislation in 2020. This parliament will consult and take forward the legislation as it normally does. So there is no delay. This is the normal process for a normal piece of legislation going through the parliament. And I thought the member would understand the processes that she takes part in for any piece of legislation in this parliament. Question number four, Mike Rumbles. To ask the Scottish Government when it will next meet Screen Scotland. Fiona Hislop. I'm meeting with Isabel Davis, the Executive Director of Screen Scotland, on the 21st of March. I meet regularly with the Chair of Creative Scotland and the Scottish Government officials attend the meetings of Creative Scotland's Screen Committee. Mike Rumbles. Is the Cabinet Secretary aware that apart from the Scottish Film Talent Network, mainly funded by lottery funding, there's very little support to help talented, young, short filmmakers from Scotland enter the industry. Indeed, with the annual closure date for the applications for the very few Film Talent Network grants available coming up in just 11 days' time, what financial assistance can the Scottish Government give to aspiring and talented Scottish short filmmakers after this date? Fiona uh, I think the member makes a very important point about the, the opportunities for young uh, filmmakers, uh, particularly in the early parts of the careers, and the importance of being able to, to make short films. Uh, short films are, are a good way of getting into recognition. Uh, and I think the issue, I'm not sure what I can do in the next 11 days, but certainly the issue of um, how Screen Scotland will be developing and supporting young talent is something that I will raise on the 21st of March. So I will raise his concerns um, with the, the director when I, when I return on the 21st of March. Supplementary from Rachel Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. We know that the uh, work of the UK government to promote the screen sector in this country has really seen the sector thrive. There has been a 632 million tax relief to the industry, which has generated a further 3 billion investment to the production of TV programmes and films across the UK. And on that point, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, does she agree that the large tax relief from the UK government has been instrumental uh, to the growth of the se screen sector in Scotland, but also is she confident that the screen sector Scotland are on target to meet their projected growth targets? Fiona Hislop. On that latter point, yes, we've seen a very, very strong production uh, growth figures, and that's before we see the results of the doubling of film investment from the Scottish Government. I completely agree that um, the tax measures the UK Government introduced have been game changer in, in many regards. Uh, we were very supportive of them and campaigned for uh, tax relief in this area and indeed in other aspects of the creative industries. So, funny enough, that argument was something I used with the tourism industry this morning, where if we could reduce VAT, for example, uh, currently at 20%, we could make a big difference in terms of helping that industry in particular. But she's absolutely right in terms of um, the, the trajectory of the film industry. Uh, and I'm very confident that uh, not only will they meet their targets, but uh, the Screen Leadership Board's recommendations are being delivered and delivered well. And there are ambitious targets within that. And they are and try to meet them. Question number five, Richard Lyle. Thank you, President Officer, to ask the Scottish Government how it is accommodating ethnic groups that have applied to be included in the census for the first time in 2021. Fiona Hislop. National Records of Scotland uh, set out proposed questions for inclusion in Census 2021. All qu requests for changes to questions were considered uh, according to user need, data quality, existing data sources and operational considerations. Requests were made for census data on Roma, show people, Sikh and Jewish populations. Uh, testing of the changes being considered for the ethnic group question completed in February. Mm -hmm. NRS are holding events on March the 27th and 28th to share the findings with stakeholders. The results of the testing will be published on the NRS website prior to these events and the questions for the 2021 census will be considered by Parliament as part of the subordinate legislation process on which engagement will begin shortly and continue through to next year. Richard Lyle. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? Can I refer members to my register of interests? I am the convener of the Showman's Guild Scotland Cross Party Group. 
Over the last few years, I've been working with the Showman's Guild to ensure that the section for show people is included in the next census. Show people are not travellers, not gypsies. They're a distinct et ethnic group. Census officials have been supportive of this proposal. Can I, I seek the assurance of the Cabinet Secretary that she will help me to ensure that, uh, uh, that they are added to the census? Fiona uh, I understand the findings from the testing um, of an alternative ethnic group question showed that the inclusion of a tick box for show people was acceptable. I understand that that may well be recommended uh, for inclusion. Uh, and uh, I think in terms of my view, I, I am supportive, but I would also refer the member to my um, answer to the first question, that actually it's the parliament through the subordinate legislation that will finally determine what questions will be asked in the census. Question number six, James Kelly. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what its priorities are for the external affairs budget spend in 2019-20. Fiona Hislop. Scotland's international framework sets out how our international work supports the, Sc the Scottish Government's central purpose of creating a more successful country with opportunities for all to flourish through increasing sustainable economic growth. The external affairs budget supports our commitment to strengthening our European and international relationships funding our commitment as a good global citizen, facilitating trade and investment actions, and ultimately achieving our overarching objective. In 2019-20, the majority of this budget will be focused on delivering our international development programme and deepening and strengthening our network of external offices. James Kelly. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. I understand the, the importance of having a presence uh, internationally in the Scottish Government, having offices in other countries. Um, however, in terms of the spend that's been budgeted for next year, it's increasing from 17.2 million to nearly 24 million, an increase of nearly 40% in cash terms. Uh, contrasted with the... Uh, could you get on with the question, please, Mr sure. Kelly? Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary why council budgets have been reduced by 200 and 230 million uh, and that the, the priority of protecting communities saving jobs and services uh, has been uh, given Mr. a lower Kelly, priority. Mr Kelly, this is not a debate, it's a question. Why has that been given a lower priority than the external affairs budget? Fiona Hislop. Uh, my understanding was James Kelly was the finance spokesperson for the Labour Party. I may be uh, wrong, so I'm happy to be corrected. He will understand that local government has not seen the reductions that he said, and actually in terms of our support for local authorities, it has uh, been positive. Uh, he also, if he is a member of the Finance Committee, I'm not sure if he has served on the Finance Committee, but all of the increase in the external affairs budget of £6.7 million in the 1920 budget is due entirely to a change in the way that running costs of staffing, for example, are presented across the Scottish Government. These were previously presented separately, but are now included within ministerial portfolios at the request of this Parliament and its Finance Committee. Mr Kelly, I think you should do your homework. Question number seven, Alex Rowley. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on what support it is providing in response to the humanitarian crisis in Yemen. Fiona Hislop. Uh, the Scottish Government uh, donated £250,000 to the Disasters Emergency Committee DEC Yemen Crisis Appeal when it was launched in December 2016. In July 2018, the Scottish Government provided a further £100,000 from the Humanitarian Emergency Fund to support Mercy Corps to provide 6,000 Yemeni households, some 42,000 people, with safe drinking water. We've also provided 25 Yemeni women with training and capacity building in the areas of mediation, conflict resolution, Reconciliation and Constitution Building through the Scottish Government funded Women in Conflict 1325 Fellowship with Beyond Borders Scotland. Alex Rowley. Uh, well done on those, 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 those commitments. 85,000 children under five have starved to death since 2015 and one child dies every 10 minutes from a preventable cause in Yemen. Oxfam state that the majority of the civilian casualties have resulted from airstrikes carried out by the Saudi-led coalition. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, has the government made representations to the UK government with regards to the violation of international law that is taking place right now, the hunger crisis that exists as a result, and the arms sales from the UK to Saudi Arabia? 
Fiona Hislop. Yes, so I have previously uh, made representation, Scottish Government has made representation to uh, the UK Government about their role in relation to Saudi Arabia and also in relation to uh, their ability and capability to end the sale of arms to Saudi Arabia. It must do so, and they must do so now. Export licences, as you will be aware, as a reserve matter, but there is clear evidence that munitions supplied by the United Kingdom have been used in breach of international law in Yemen, and I commend the member for continuing to raise the issue of Yemen. Uh, this has caused devastation to so many people, and particularly, as he referred to, children. And there is a clear responsibility that the UK government to, can take. If he wants to be a global citizen, it needs to behave as a global citizen. And he's absolutely right to raise this issue in this parliament. Uh, can I apologise to Mr Beattie for not having reached his question? And we will move on to the next portfolio, which is education and skills. May I also remind all members that this is question time and not speech making time. And if that was adhered to as far as questions and answers was concerned, we would certainly get through all questions and have more supplementaries. Question number one, Fulton McGregor. Um, thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the recent survey by Given Time, which found that only 19% of parents knew of the right to defer entry into primary school for children born between September and December. John Swinney. President Officer, I'm grateful to Fulton McGregor and the Give Them Time campaign for raising awareness of this issue. I would reassure parents that implementation of curriculum for excellence early level and good transition arrangements should make the journey from early learning and childcare into primary education seamless and minimise the need for school deferral. However, it is important that parents are able to make informed choices for their child. The Minister for Children and Young People met with representatives of the Give Them Time campaign in December. The Scottish Government and COSLA are now working together to improve the clarity of information available to parents at a national and local level. I expect all local authorities to provide clear and consistent information on school deferral arrangements. Fulton McGregor. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. He may be aware that the approval rates for granting discretionary funding for nursery provision for children whose parents choose to defer is inconsistent across councils, being between 13 per cent and 100 per cent. And what's more, at least 13 local authorities do not even permit parents to retain their child's place in a council setting and self-finance it. What more does he think that councils can do to support parents who choose to defer their four-year-old ch four children and access an additional year at nursery? John Swinney. The issue, uh, the issue remains at the local authorities' discretion uh, as to whether or not children with a birthday between August and the 31st of December are entitled to uh, additional early learning and childcare funding. Uh, I would expect local authorities to make this decision based on an assessment of well-being as set out in the early learning and childcare statutory guidance that accompanied the Children and Young People Scotland Act 2014. Where deferral is being considered, parents should be provided with accurate information and should be fully involved in the decision-making process. Supplementary, Ian Gray. Uh, thank you. Um, does the Cabinet Secretary not think that there is simply an anomaly here whereby parents have the right to defer entry to school quite correctly, uh, but then find that for many of them, uh, that means they lose their child's right to funded places at nursery? It's the simplest thing not simply to change the law. Why can't we do that? John Swinney. I think the, 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 I think the answer is in, to, the, to the point that Mr Gray raises is in the first answer that I gave to, uh, to Mr McGregor, in that the, uh, what we conceive to be the contents of the early level of curriculum for excellence, which, as Mr Gray will know, is a, a play-based uh, approach to learning, supported by good transition arrangements, it should make the journey from early learning and, and childcare into primary education uh, a straightforward journey. So I, I think the, 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 the flexibility is there to accommodate uh, the particular issues that are raised in this question. But equally, the arrangements under the early level um, a, a curricular approach um, address many of these questions into the bargain to make sure that we're making judgments about the interests and the needs and the perspectives of individual children. Question number two, Mary Fee. To ask the Scottish Government how it plans to support school pupils on part-time timetables. John Swinney. 
Uh, President officer, support for pupils on part-time timetables is provided through included engage, engaged and involved parts one and two, which provide guidance on the promotion of attendance and the management of exclusion. Both recognise the importance of continued engagement in order to fulfil pupils' learning potential. Part two makes clear that flexible or part-time arrangements, and I quote, should be for a short agreed period with the aims and conditions around this recorded in any support plan. Uh, that's the end of the quote. It is for education authorities to ensure that pupils receive the support they need to benefit from educational opportunities in line with their responsibilities for the provision of education. Mary Fee. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? The Scottish Government is starting to collect information on the number of children on part-time timetables, and it needs to make clear the level of use and the reason for such actions by schools. But does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that any pupil on a part-time timetable should be on one for their own benefit, and it must be meaningful to their education? John Swinney. I, I do agree with that uh, perspective. As I indicated in my answer, um, the, the use of part-time timetables should be for a short agreed period with a clearly defined purpose and uh, that is what the guidance clearly states and I very much endorse the points raised by Mary Fee. Supplementary, Oliver Mundell. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, to ask the Cabinet Secretary whether he shares my concern that some young people are being excluded from the classroom itself for large parts of the day without meaningful educational input and in some uh, rural areas are being supervised uh, by parents and volunteers. Um, what will the Scottish Government do to address this? John Swinney. Well, well, fundamentally, the responsibility for tackling these issues lies with the individual local authority. Uh, that's the local authority carries the responsibility, the statutory responsibility for delivery of education at local level. Um, so the local authority has to satisfy itself that in all circumstances a child's education is being fulfilled. So that's what the law says. And the guidance that is put in place through included, engaged and involved, as I've said to um, uh, Mary Fee in relation to questions of part-time timetables, um, should be uh, as part of an agreed process for the um, improvement of the interests of individual young people. And uh, uh, the guidance also is emphatic on the importance of ensuring inclusion in all aspects of learning for young people and for the minimisation of exclusion from learning. Question number three, Margaret Mitchell. To ask uh, the Scottish Government what action it's taking to tackle assaults on teachers and classroom assistants. John Swinney. Presiding officer, it is not acceptable for anyone working in our schools to be assaulted verbally or physically. We are continually working with local authorities to support schools in developing positive and inclusive learning environments. We have produced guidance on approaches to include and engage pupils in their education and we are funding various violence reduction and preventative approaches, such as the Mentors in Violence Prevention Programme and the No Knives, Better Lives Initiative. Our aim is to foster positive relationships and behaviour within a school, as well as a longer term impact on the wider community. Margaret Mitchell. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer, but is he aware in the last three years teachers have been attacked on more than 16,000 times, with these attacks increasing in the last year? And according to FOI responses, weapons include knives, um, a BB gun, a chemical cleaner, a woodwork chisel, all have been used, resulting in injuries including torn ligaments, dislocated joints and one case of whiplash. In view of this, is, does the Cabinet Secretary couldn't consider the action he has just outlined, I appreciate it was quite detailed, is sufficient to ensure that teachers and school staff feel safe in the classroom? John Swinney. Well, the first thing I want to say is to say that in no circumstances is any instance of violence in any way acceptable or excusable within any situation and particularly not in a school. So whatever else I say today, I want to make that point absolutely crystal clear. Now, the context for this, I think, is important. If we look at the number of police recorded crimes of handling an offensive weapon, for example, we've seen a fall of 65% in those crimes since 2006-07 to 2017-18. We've seen a, a huge decline in the number of exclusions from our schools um, in the period since 2006-07. So we, we've seen very significant reductions in violence in our society and in our schools, but I accept that there are still examples of that. Now, we, I've set out to Margaret Mitchell, and she's um, generously said there was a, a number of things that, uh, initiatives and approaches that I pointed out. Um, 
I think these are effective. I think the, the Mentors in Violence Reduction programme is very successful. The No Knives Better Lives campaign has been very successful in changing the culture around knife carrying. And we're seeing many, much of that learning being looked at by uh, other jurisdictions, particularly the City of London, for what's been achieved. Having said all of that, I am absolutely committed to working with the teaching profession and with local authorities to make sure that we make violence within our schools um, a, a thing of the past and that teachers and classroom assistants and any other members of staff or any other pupils should not be subjected to it. Question number four, Stuart McMillan. Thank you, Senator officer, to ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to promote STEM subjects to pupils across Scotland during 2019, which marks the bicentenary of the death of James Watt. Richard Lockhead. James Watt's achievements make a significant contribution to Scotland's long and proud history of science, engineering and invention. We are committed to promoting STEM to everyone in Scotland and on the 13th of March we announced our funding for the four Scottish Science Centres worth over £2.6 million 2019-2020. That funding will support events and activities seen by around 700,000 people next year, making science accessible hopefully for all ages and helping to inspire our future scientists. In addition, we are establishing a new Young STEM Leaders Programme and have introduced Maths Week Scotland as part of further measures to promote STEM to young people. Stuart McMillan. I thank the Minister for that reply. And uh, as the Minister will know, STEM subjects are vital for our economy and also for the, the Scottish Government has introduced the, the range of measures uh, which I uh, generally welcome. Uh, with the UK Government's Brexit chaos already leading to challenges in academic funding and also job security, what can the Scottish Government do to ensure that our school pupils are taught about Scottish inventors and also inventions to actually help them realise that Scotland has always been a contributor to global progress. Richard Lockhead. Well, Stuart McMillan highlights, of course, a very topical and important issue in that if we are taken out of Europe against our will, we will lose many of the people with the vital skills we require for the future of the Scottish economy and therefore it will be even more important uh, to encourage people to adopt those skills and learn them uh, in their own country, which means inspiring our young people to take part in STEM activities and hopefully consider STEM careers as part of their future. And that's why it is so important that we continue to support many initiatives across Scotland that are working with school pupils in particular. And indeed, I was at a company just last week where the apprentices who were there are effectively STEM ambassadors for their company and they go out and speak to local schools about their careers. So we have to reinforce and, and support in any way we can these kind of activities. But let's try and focus on stopping Scotland and taking it to Europe in the first place. Uh, before I call question five, can I draw members' attention to the headphones on your desk that can be used for simultaneous translation of Gaelic if required? Question number five, Alistair Allen. Uh, John Swinney. The Scottish Government is working with partners to put in place a range of actions to strengthen the Gaelic language in the Western Isles with the aim of increasing the proportion of young people who speak Gaelic. This includes close collaboration with Corley and Union Share with, and with other bodies that can make a contribution to promoting the use, of learn, uh, the use, the learning and the speaking of the Gaelic language. Alison Allen. John Swinney. The, the, the Gaelic language is a, a very precious part of Scotland's culture, our identity and our future. And for that reason, the government takes a number of policy interventions to support the development and the nurture of the Gaelic language. We don't have Im any immediate plans to undertake the type of Gaelic language impact assessment that Dr. Allen has raised in his question. But I want to assure him of very specific discussions that we are having with Corleone and Neil and Sher, which I took part in along with Dr. Allen when I was in the Western Isles uh, during the February recess, uh, to look at how we can integrate um, the experience and the nurturing of the Gaelic language within wider public service provision within the Western Isles 
and to make sure some of this activity is taken through forward by some of the Corliss proposals in relation to a community charter or a community offer. Now, these issues are now under very active consideration by the government, and I will have further discussions um, with uh, the Corla and also with Border Gaelic as to how we can take forward some of these ideas. Question number six, Anna Sauer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the ongoing dispute between lecturers and management at the City of Glasgow College. Richard Lockett. In terms of the City of Glasgow College, local industrial relations are, of course, a matter for the College and the trade unions to resolve voluntarily, and therefore the member may wish to speak to these authorities for an update. Anna Sarver. I can reassure the Minister that I have spoken directly to both EIS and the College for an update, and I hope the Minister too is taking an active interest in the ongoing disputes, because while it is a separate dispute from the wider dispute on pay with Colleges Scotland, it does feed into the wider breakdown of relationship between the workforce and management. The First Minister last week at First Minister's question uh, please, said... Please, Mr Sarwar, would you get on with the question? The First Minister last week said that a 2% increase for police officers in England was a punch Would you get on with the question, this please, the Mr question, Sarwar? Uh, why does the Cabinet expect to believe, then, that this is an acceptable pay increase for our college lecturers? Richard Lockhead. Well, in terms of what, or what is not an acceptable pay increase for college lecturers, is a matter for negotiations between the employers, the colleges and the representatives of the staff, uh, the unions. I should say that I was disappointed when the talks that took place in terms of the wider dispute uh, that took place on Monday of this week did not reach a successful conclusion, albeit there have been some signs of movement in recent uh, months, uh, and therefore there is uh, more industrial action he'll be aware of that's taking place tomorrow, which is highly regrettable given that it's in no one's interest that such action takes place in terms of strike action, at uh, least of all the students who are directly affected uh, as well. And I will, however, of course, take an interest in these discussions, but the Scottish Government is not a party to these negotiations. This is voluntary arrangements agreed by both the employers and the unions in terms of national bargaining. And any intervention from us, of course, would just undermine that. This should be resolved between the two parties, and we hope it will be. We will continue to speak, of course, to both the unions and the employers, and I am of a mind to invite them in to meet me separately on Tuesday of next week, prior to the next round of formal talks uh, on the 29th of March. Can I remind members that while a degree of context is often necessary to ask questions, uh, a small degree is preferable. Uh, question number seven, Tom Mason. To ask the Scottish Government how relevant the number of subjects that people can study in, a, in school is to their future career prospects. John Swiddy. Uh, offering Scotland's young people the right choices is very relevant to supporting them and meeting their career prospects. Young people should be able to access the range of pathways that meet their needs, abilities and aspirations and should be supported in making the right choices. This is central to the aims of our youth employment strategy. Tom Mason. Presiding officer, committee evidence and newspaper reports have highlighted the narrowing of subject choices caused by the SNP government's flawed reforms is hurting people's career prospect. It is hampering Scottish children's ability to achieve the best grades possible and limiting their opportunities. What does the Cabinet Secretary have to say to those children who, through no fault of their own, won't receive the same opportunities that their parents had? John Swinney. Can I respectfully say to Tom Mason, I don't think the evidence supports the question that he's just put to me. Uh, two weeks ago, we published the information on the positive destinations of young people leaving education. They are at a record high. 94.4% 94 of young people are leaving school to enter work, training or further and higher education. That is an all-time record. So the premise of Mr Mason's question is completely flawed. In addition to that, um, we see attainment rising in our schools. Uh, we see uh, a broad range of qualifications being secured by young people. And we see every single young people experiencing and benefiting from the, the, the importance of the broad general education, which was at the heart of the reform of Curriculum for Excellence. And finally, can I say to Mr Mason, last week I attended the International Summit of the Teaching Profession in Helsinki. The only um, education systems that are invited, invited to take part in that uh, summit are high-performing education systems in the world. And I think we should be very proud that Scotland's education system was invited to be part of those discussions. Question number eight, John Scott. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government, in light of the Education Secretary's
previous comments that the education bill could still be introduced if sufficient progress is not made, whether it is ruled out doing so in 2019. John Swinney. Mr. Officer, local government entered in a joint, into a joint agreement with us on reform, which has led to the publication of the Head Teachers Charter and wider guidance on empowering schools. We have also reached agreement subject to the definitive formal offer being made and a ballot of members with the EIS that sees Scotland's largest teaching professional association agree to collaborate with us on the empowerment agenda. I am encouraged about the progress that has been made in implementing our landmark education reforms. John Scott. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, the Education Bill was dropped by the SNP last year despite calling it their flagship piece of legislation. Dropping the bill was supposed to speed up the process of reform, but we are now nine months on and there are very few signs of progress. Will the Cabinet Secretary tell parents and teachers how much longer they will have to wait to see all the promised reforms fully realised? John Swinney. I, again, I, I, I think the, it would have helped if John Scott had maybe listened to my original answer before he gave me his pre-scripted uh, follow-up question. I announced to him that the Head Teacher's Charter is already in place. That wouldn't have been the case if we were waiting for a bill. It wouldn't have happened. The Empowering Schools guidance is in place, working, operating. The agreement with uh, the professional associations on their support and participation in the empowerment agenda is in place and happening quicker than could have been the case with a bill. So I think the approach that I've taken has um, delivered an intensification of the pace of reform. The education system is benefiting from that. We are seeing real empowerment in our classrooms uh, and our schools around the country. And I'm encouraged by the direction of travel that's been undertaken in this respect. That concludes portfolio questions and we will move on to the next item of business. If you would take your seats quickly, please.